like I mentioned in the last uh, PowerPoint presentation, scarcity is a situation where there's a lack of resources to meet the wants of everyone. Humans have unlimited desires, but we have limited means to achieve those. Um, because of this, we're forced to make choices between limited resources. So we have to choose which of these needs is the most important for us to meet. Uh, now, this may seem fairly simple and intuitive, but there are far-reaching implications from the idea of scarcity. The fact that we're forced to choose um, gives rise to economics, the uh, attempt to study how individuals make these choices. Now, I also quickly want to touch on the difference between scarcity and poverty. So poverty can be eradicated while scarcity cannot be eradicated. Um, poverty is an arbitrary line that we draw um, basically setting the um, standard of living, that people must have, you know, certain things in order to be considered not living in poverty. Now, this will change over time, what we consider the basic standard of living, as people become wealthier and as societies become wealthier. Um, so, an absence of poverty would mean that everyone has met a basic standard of living, that people have, say, an automobile, a washing machine, a television. And, you know, say a certain amount of money saved up for retirement. In absence of scarcity, I put question marks there because it's hard to imagine the ability to meet every single want and need of everyone in society. So because of the existence of scarcity, um, societies are required to somehow ration the goods and services. So every society needs a method to ration those scarce resources to try to determine their best usage. Um, they need some sort of metric to determine the best uses of resources and then who is able to consume them. So for individuals, we're talking about finished goods, trying to decide between different finished goods um, to see which of those goods uh, fulfills their needs the best. And for firms, we're talking about uh, resources and intermediate goods that are going to be used in production later to determine the best resources to use to produce those goods um, that that consumers are eventually going to consume. Now we use, and most of the world uses, markets in order, and the prices that result from the use of markets in order to ration resources. Um, hopefully through this class, you'll learn why the market is the most effective and efficient way to ration goods. So the next guidepost to economic thinking is the fact that competition is everywhere. So because there are limits on the wants and we're forced to choose between alternatives, this gives rise to competition. There's only so many resources out there that can be used to build, for instance, phones between Apple and Samsung. Therefore, those two firms must compete to buy resources. Um, in this case, competition is just the price that they're going to be willing to pay to whoever is providing the raw materials to build those phones. Um, now, even in a world without greed, if people were entirely not self-interested, competition would still exist. So in this case, a person would have to, truly altruistic person with no care about themselves, only about others, would have to think, should I donate to the Red Cross or the Relay for Life? One of those two charities is going to have to prove why they deserve that donation more, why they um, are able to better satisfy, better prevent um, human suffering, or maybe they're more efficient with the money and more of the money gets out to actually helping people. Um, there's still a scarce amount of money in the world. There's a limit to the amount of money that those charitable organizations can get. So there's competition, competition, excuse me, between them to try to get more resources in order to help people. So again, this is competition existing even when people are acting altruistically. So if we change the method of rationing, we change it from the market to other methods, that does not eliminate competition. It only changes the nature of competition. So in the Soviet Union, um, they were a full command and control economy. What was produced and how it was produced and how much was produced was all determined by central planning boards. Despite the fact that they did not have markets, they still had competition. There was just a different form of competition. The next guidepost to economic thinking is the idea of opportunity cost. So when you buy a product, you do more than just, you know, pull out cash and hand that for whatever you want to buy. There's other forms of costs that aren't explicitly just monetary. Um, 
So the opportunity cost is the cost incurred by not enjoying the benefit associated with the best alternative choice. And again, this arises because of the existence of scarcity. So now, um, opportunity costs are subjective. There's, there's no like objective metric for opportunity cost because the alternative is not actually acted upon. It's in each individual's mind. So um, let's look at an example, the cost of education. Obviously there's books, there, the price of books, there's the tuition, there's maybe like the laptop, the time you have to put into it. These are all like typical costs associated with universities, but there's also opportunity costs. You could have made income if you would have been working instead of taking, you know, taking those courses, educating yourself. Um, so that's the opportunity cost, what you're giving up. Um, also missing out on a vacation. You're giving, giving up that vacation in order to, I don't know, to, to get the education. So again, that's something else you're missing out on. Now, because of opportunity costs, this leads us to another way, another tool of analysis that we need to use, which is marginal analysis. And marginal analysis is just considering the next unit of something. So economists, when we talk about costs and benefits and we analyze and compare them, we typically use marginal analysis. So now the marginal benefit is the additional benefit from one more unit of an activity or good. Likewise, the marginal cost is the additional cost of one more unit of an activity or a good. So marginal decision-making is the focus of economics. Uh, we don't face all or nothing choices we buy an additional unit of something, or we, um, so for example, do you want to buy another shirt or do you want to buy, like go out and buy dinner tonight? That's a marginal decision. We're not looking at, do I want to buy food or do I want to buy clothing? And I can only have food or I can only have clothing. It's, does this next unit provide us of, you know, whatever good or service provide us with more benefit than the next unit of cash that we're going to be spending on? Now putting this together, what does it all mean? means that individuals engage in activity when the expected marginal benefit exceeds the expected marginal cost. Now remember, the individual can be wrong, so it's the expected marginal benefit and the expected marginal cost. Individuals can be expected to refrain from an activity when the expected marginal cost exceeds the expected marginal benefit. Obviously, if the cost of doing something is more than the benefit you receive from it, you're not going to engage in that activity. Now, individuals weigh the expected costs and benefits differently. So this leads to difficulty in requiring other individuals to make the choices that you want. And this is very important. Now, when it comes to marginal benefits, there's a, a basic law of, it's called the law of diminishing marginal benefits. So over time, as you consume more and more units of a good or service, the marginal benefit that you receive decreases. So for instance, you order pizza with your friends. That first slice of pizza, pizza that you eat is going to taste better, it's going to satisfy you more than that last pizza. Each slice, say you get more full, you get more used to the taste, maybe you prefer some variety. Um, definitely the fullness factor comes in around the 10th slice of pizza. Um, and at that point, it's you're giving yourself more discomfort because you're so full than the benefit you get from the taste of the pizza. There's a little graph here on the slide showing how, how utility decreases and eventually even turns negative. At a certain point, you may eat so much pizza that, uh, that the pain in your stomach um, from overeating is far greater than the um, benefit, than the joy you get from tasting the delicious pizza. So the next guidepost to economic thinking is that incentives matter. Now this is the most important concept that you'll learn in this course. Hopefully you'll learn it and be able to internalize this. Now, incentives is the idea. When the cost of an activity rises, we do less of it. And then when the cost of an activity falls, we do more of it. And the same basic concept for benefits. So if the benefit of an activity rises, we'll tend to do it more. And if the benefit of an activity falls, we'll do it less. Um, so for a basic example, if you increase the cost of milk when you go to buy to the supermarket, fewer people are going to buy milk because it's relatively more costly. 
And it's not just true in market um, interactions, it's true in um, anytime human choice is involved. So for another example, if you increase the cost of soup kitchens, you're going to see fewer soup kitchens. So if you do something, um, say you, you put a tax for some reason on soup kitchens, because it's more expensive, you'll end up seeing fewer soup kitchens overall. Um, and a final example, rainy weather uh, reduces voter turnout and people actually going out to vote because there's that increased cost of having to deal with the rain and walk through the rain. Um, people end up voting less, fewer people vote. Um, that's crappy. Weather. So the next idea um, that I want you to keep in your mind is the idea of the seen versus the unseen. So economics examines the observable consequences of actions and it, it examines the unseen consequences of those actions. So um, when you're doing this analysis, always ask yourself what happens next. So one action, one purchase, one price change, whatever, will change people's incentives. And remember, when incentives change, people's actions will tend to change. So a particular policy may have a good result in the short run or may have a good result for one particular group. But if that policy changes the incentives for other groups um, and encourages them to act in a way that ends up being costly for society, it will lessen the positive effect of that policy or even be a net negative. Um, so, for example, from the financial crisis, we, um, we've developed this idea in banking regulation of too big to fail, that certain banks are so large and so important to our economy that their failure would be catastrophic and make everyone worse off. However, insurance against a risky behavior tends to encourage it because now it's less costly. So in the short run, this idea of too big to fail may have prevented the financial crisis from being even worse. So stepping in, bailing out these banks may have had a great short run consequence to help people help prevent the crisis from becoming worse. But in the long run, because now you've changed the incentives, you made it relatively less costly for these large banks to take risks. Now they're going to engage in more risky behavior. So you're lessening the positive effect of the policy and maybe even turning it negative. The next idea is that value is subjective. Now they say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder and that's sort of the idea here. So the value of a good or service varies with each individual's own personal preferences. So, um, it varies with their needs and their wants. So value is determined by what each individual is willing and able to pay for a good or service. Um, value is not inherent in a good. There's no objective standard of value. So the classical economists, um, they believed in what was called the labor theory of value. The basic idea being that the value of goods are determined by the cost of production. So how much money it costs to produce a good is how much that good is actually worth. Um, in fact, value, each individual places a different value on goods and services based on how well it meets their particular wants and needs. So a good example is old coin collectors. People are willing to pay substantially more for for old coins than what they're actually worth, you know, to be able to spend. Um, that's because these old coins aren't just money for people. Um, for old coin collectors, they get, they derive actual value from being able to to own and handle and look at these old coins. So for them, it's worth much more than someone else who would only see that as a way to buy or sell to get other goods. Now, subjective value makes mutually beneficial exchange possible. And without subjective value, if it was only objective value determined, uh, I don't know, like the value, say determined by the cost of labor going into it, then mutually beneficial exchange would not be possible. In mutually beneficial exchange, both parties, like in a trade or in a purchase, are made better off as a result of that trade. So when I go to the grocery store and I pay, I don't know, say, say I buy $50 worth of groceries, I value that food more than I value the $50, so more than I value whatever else I could buy with that particular $50. On the other hand, the grocery store values that money more than it values the groceries that they're selling me. So because we both had different values for both sides of um, the transaction, 
we are both able to be made better off by that same transaction. So rather than being taken advantage of or me taking advantage of the grocery store, we're both making ourselves better off um, getting what we want. Voluntary trade can increase the total wealth in an economy because individuals value what they receive more than what they give up. So if you think about it, it's making the economy better off because it's, people are able to meet their needs even better than they were before. This idea is going to come into play later in the course. This idea of subjective value leads us to the diamond water paradox. The classical economists could not figure out this question using the labor theory of value. It was only when we started incorporating the subjective theory of value that economists were able to solve this problem. So the question, why do diamonds have a higher exchange value than water? Why does it cost more to buy diamonds than it costs to buy water? When diamonds are an old quote, mere frippery, while well, water is essential to life. Now, there's a couple parts to this answer. First of all is the marginal analysis. No individual is ever in the position of choosing between all the diamonds in the world and all the water in the world. They're choosing between one diamond and one cup of water. So if offered a choice between a cup of water and a handful of diamonds, most people would pick the handful of diamonds because the marginal utility of those diamonds, the amount of, of pleasure or joy or benefit that we get from that handful of diamonds from the next unit of diamonds is higher than the marginal utility of that particular cup of water because we have so much water. Um, the next cup of water is only gonna provide a little bit of satisfaction in normal everyday life. Less satisfaction than those diamonds will. The final guidepost to economic thinking is that information is costly. Uh, this is something we don't tend to think about, but it's something that's important to keep in mind. Is that Now, information helps us make better choices. The more informed we are, the better choice we can make. But it's expensive to acquire information. It takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of research. We could be doing a lot of other things, when we're gathering that information. So the opportunity cost of gathering information is quite high. Um, so perfect or complete information, knowing everything about the decision we're trying to make is not optimal. It costs too much to do that. So the implication of this is that since information is scarce, uncertainty and information asymmetry is a fact of life. Information asymmetry is when one person in an exchange has more information than the other person um, other party in that exchange. So there's constantly situations where we don't have a lot of information. We're uncertain about maybe what the true quality of a good is, what the um, actual effect, will that good truly be able to meet our needs? Um, we just don't know. We don't have that knowledge. And some people have more knowledge than other people. This is a fact of life and it constantly um, goes on in the world.